Welcome to the newest episode of Beatin' and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. Today's video is a recap of the NASCAR split weekend at Portland and St. Louis, including that unbelievable finish at Worldwide Technology Raceway. I have the understandably shocked radio communication from Ryan Blaney when he realized he had run out of gas mere feet from taking the white flag. However, before we get to the cup race and the crazy ending, let's go back to Friday night and the NHRA races at New Hampshire. Yes, NHRA, and the only reason I bring it up is because of what I heard during the broadcast about Tony Stewart. Take a listen. This has been a significant week of news for Tony Stewart. The announcement of Stewart Haas Racing ceasing their operation at the end of the 2024 NASCAR campaign. Will this allow maybe an expansion for this team? We do know one thing, Tony, is from our personal conversation, this guy is fully emotionally invested in this sport. There's no question about that. He's, he's re-energized. He's very motivated. I think it was a given that we knew Tony's heart wasn't in NASCAR anymore. That's pretty clear now that he's racing in HRA. But to hear those words that he's emotionally invested in the sport and energized and motivated won't be what anyone at SHR wants to hear. Painful, to say the least. Moving on to Saturday and west to Portland and the Xfinity Series race, there were a couple of things of note to me. First, a coyote. Yes, a coyote made its way onto the track at the end of Stage 2 and the Fox cameras caught it. Watch this. A coyote? We've got wildlife on the loose. <laughs> oh! Only oh in the my great lord. Whoa! <laughs> Holy smoke. Oh my that's a that's a pass through penalty, I think, right there. <laughs> I'm not sure if you saw this happen on the broadcast, but if you did. You didn't know the final outcome for the animal because Fox went to a commercial break while the animal was still on the track. The coyote hadn't made that beeline straight for the fast approaching number 42 of Leland Honeyman. This video is from the NASCAR Xfinity X account. They provided the full version. Fortunately, based on the footage, the animal made it off the track unharmed and didn't meet the unfortunate fate of the cat last year at Fontana. The race itself turned out to be entertaining, as Shane Van Gisbergen outlasted Justin Allgaier to earn his first Xfinity Series win on the road course. What happened after was equally entertaining, as the Kiwi did a drifting burnout around the track on his cooldown lap. Apparently, this has become his trademark move in supercars. But then, the Chicago Cup race winner of a year ago, who didn't do any crazy celebration last year in the Windy City, got his track house groove on, like Ross Chastain's watermelon smash and Daniel Suarez's pinata bash. When he had a rugby ball thrown to him from one of his crew, signed it, then punted it into the stands. Honestly, I was impressed at the distance of his kick. I also thought it was interesting, during his winning post-race interview, how his first words were an apology to Sam Mayer for mucking it up with him on the first lap of the race and he did it all with that trademark smile. SVG is good for this sport, and I think he's got more wins in both series ahead. Now, on to Sunday's Cup Series race, and once again, I have to talk about Fox's coverage. Trust me, I'm counting down the number of Cup races left on the network this year. Yes, there's mercifully just one race remaining. Next week at Sonoma is the final time fans will have to pull out their hair, or in my case, what very little hair I have left from the angst in each broadcast. The result of a production that has become so bad with so much regularity that a part of me thinks they're trolling us. Seriously, I really do. The production didn't wait long for the first maddening moment of the day and it came before the race even started, when Kevin Harvick talked from the Fox broadcast booth over the team radio with pole sitter Michael McDowell, and warned him about the upcoming explosions that had become a big part of the pre-race festivities at Gateway, a massive wall of bright yellow-orange flames shooting straight up on the backstretch of the 1.25-mile track, a rolling black cloud soon developing that rains down ashes from the sky. Five minutes after the conversation, Nothing. Not so much as a mention. Ten minutes later and the race well underway, still not a word on the telecast. Some might suggest maybe it hadn't happened. Well, I'm 110% sure it had because Ty Gibbs was talking about it on his number 54 team radio and how NASCAR might consider cleaning it up before dropping the green flag. Here's what he had to say. Yeah, they need to go 
to blow the back stretch off because there's like ash all over it from this fire thing, like everywhere. All right, ten four. I'll pass it on. I also heard Kyle Bush say something similar on his radio, but wasn't recording. And then, exactly 14 minutes after Harvick first mentioned the fireworks to McDowell, Fox finally showed the wall of fire after the first caution of the race on lap three, when John Hunter Nemechek and Cody Ware were involved in an incident. They also showed the resulting soot on the front-facing camera on one of the cars, and Boyer suggested maybe NASCAR should have blown off the track. And they were just getting started. While on the subject of Fox and Worldwide Technology Raceway, I just want to point out how long fans have had to put up with this kind of frustrating coverage. Here's the story I wrote about the very same subject in 2022. You might remember the race. It's where Ross Chastain sent Denny Hamlin into the wall, and the number 11 then deliberately held up the trackhouse car, and a rivalry was born. Yeah, you remember that, but you likely don't remember, if you were watching it at home, that you completely missed it live. That's because the broadcast was in a commercial break. That broadcast also included a Mike Joy call of Ricky Stenhouse Jr. getting into Bubba Wallace and bringing out the caution that wasn't shown for a full six seconds after it happened. You get the point. More on Fox in a bit. With the race green, Michael McDowell surged out to the lead and was the dominant car for the first 40 laps. Then Christopher Bell, after numerous attempts, made the pass and drove to the stage one win. Now, I have to give Fox some credit. During the stage break, they showed the pit stops for both Denny Hamlin and Chase Elliott, and it offered a unique view that was a cool look. I really hope they continue to show that because it was clearly a shot from atop the pit box. Nice angle. The start of stage two was a strategy play. FYI, strategy was the drinking word for the race. The strategy for Kyle Busch worked out as he was one of multiple cars that had pitted following the early crash between Nemechek and Ware. The number eight cycled to the front, got a good restart, and took the lead. Right behind Rowdy was a surprise in his RCR teammate, Austin Dillon. But just under 25 laps into the run, and the number 20 car had made its way back to the point. However, just past the lap 100 mark, there was a scene we haven't seen at all this year. There were seven Fords in front, albeit some of them due to, you guessed it, strategy. With 30 to go in the stage, Josh Berry, who had been running inside the top 10, blew a tire. He was understandably unhappy and made an unexpected remark. All right, bud. Piece of shit, race car. All I could think of is a couple of years ago and the guy up in the broadcast booth who previously drove the number four car and his crappy ass parts remark after his car caught on fire at Darlington. To close out the stage, I was listening to Kyle Bush's radio when we had some Kyle on Kyle crime. Bush getting into Larson on the straightaway, and then the 2021 champion getting loose and drifting up into the side of the two time champ for a synchronized crash in the corner. We're in the wall. Caution, no. Caution, no. It's done. I'll see you back in the truck. It was the first DNF of the year for the RCR driver. During the pit stops, Ty Gibbs was nabbed for speeding. I know I've talked about his outburst at others lately. Here's his considerably different response after making his own mistake. Well, that's on me. I apologize. Let's go get it back here. Yeah, it's, it's no big deal. Just go after it. One at a time, though. That's all you can do. Yep, for sure. Still on it. In that third and final stage, Penske teammates Ryan Blaney and Austin Sendrick surged out to the lead, but everyone knew Christopher Bell, who restarted 13th, was coming. With 30 laps to go, the JGR driver who won the rain-shortened Coca-Cola 600 the week before passed Cendric and moved into second. And then the race was on. Bell and Blaney had an entertaining battle for the next 10 laps. And then with 19 to go, the number 20 pilot came over the radio with terrible news that his car was blowing up. Game over. Blaney held a 2.5 second lead over his teammate at that point. The race was his to win until it wasn't. Coming out of turn four and just feet from taking the white flag, Blaney realized he was out of fuel and angrily delivered the bad news to his team. 1.2, coming to the white. How about a gas? Half back here. Clear, clear, clear. Coming to the white. I can't believe it. we had a fucking gas, man. Hold your line here. Three of them in a row coming. Yeah, that was going to fucking stink. Appreciate the effort all weekend. Should have won. 
Austin Cedric made the pass at the start-finish line and cruised around the track a final time to earn his second career win and lock himself into the playoffs. Cedric's win was a surprise, but so were the finishes of several others inside the top 10, including Austin Dillon, Carson Hosevar, and Justin Haley. Dillon finishing 6th and Hosevar finishing 8th were season-best results for both, as was the 9th for Haley. What's interesting about Haley is it was his second top 10 in three weeks, both on non-super speedways, which are the only two times in Rick Ware racing history that that's happened. Kudos to the number 51 team. I also wanted to mention something that happened after the race. Brad Keselowski, who finished third for his third consecutive top three finish, had a nice moment with his former Penske teammate. Just shows you what kind of guy Brad is. And lastly, let's circle back to Fox. Not sure if you were watching it, but during the post-race interviews, the ticker was running across the bottom of the screen, showing the finishing positions of the drivers. Look who finished 10th. Yeah, a driver who wasn't even in the race. Fox's crack staff graphics department just used last week's race graphics. For clarification, it was Larson who finished 10th. Remember, just one more race with Fox. All right, guys, that's a wrap on this episode. Thoughts? What did you think about SVG's first Xfinity Series win and his post-race celebration? And what did you think about Sunday's cup race and all the strategy involved? Are you as excited as I am about NBC taking over coverage in a couple of weeks? Who surprised you and who messed up your Denny Hamlin bracket challenge? Speaking of Hamlin, he finished second. Yeah, no one talked about him, but he was running in the top five for most of the day and took advantage of the issues for Blaney and Bell to finish runner-up. If you want to read my written work, go check it out at heavy.com. Also, go to beatingandbanging.com if you want to sign up for my weekly newsletter and you'll receive an email each Friday recapping the top stories from the week, including reviews of the various NASCAR-related podcasts. Also, make sure to check out my Beating and Banging podcast on the Blue Wire Network. Thanks again, as always, for supporting the channel, and have a great rest of your day.